Hey, Jim here from Japan coming at you. I'm a scuba diving instructor, underwater enthusiast, and part philosopher. I've heard a lot about this movie, Sea Spiracy on Netflix, so I wanted to have a look and give you my thoughts. I'm going to be watching this off screen so as not to make copyright issues. So if you want to hear my thoughts and comments, put on your seatbelt and let's go. What I admire about Ali here is he's kind of proactive in his small way. You know, even, even for this video, it looks like his equipment is pretty simple. Him and his girlfriend, I don't know how well supported they are. In addition, he's talking about his action, like calling up places, asking them not to use plastic. And my information, happy to be wrong, happy to hear more information. My information is most of the ocean bound, the actual plastic that's dumped unenvironmentally actually doesn't come from developed countries. It comes from undeveloped countries or developing countries. I won't mention their names, but perhaps you know what they are. Yeah, the next part of the video, uh, he starts to concentrate on the whaling and the dolphin killing practices in Japan. And here he's talking to Rick O'Berry uh, about the practice and the whaling, you know, under the guise of, of scientific whaling. Taiji, that is just a, a heartbreaking scene. Uh, and he's going to talk about the, uh, the situation with the dolphins there. The taking of those dolphins uh, for aquariums, performances, performing aquariums, and uh, just outright killing them and asking like why. Yeah, I tell you, the part uh, of this documentary that concentrates on, on Ali's uh, visit to uh, Taiji is really heartbreaking. You know, if you're not up to see a bunch of, of dolphins getting killed, this is, you know, a tough scene, a tough part of the video to watch. And now, the really upsetting thing for me here is how they're talking about how the um, aquariums, the aquarium business, the aquarium industry, um, and I'm talking about the big aquariums, you know, SeaWorld type aquariums here in Japan support these activities in Taiji because dolphins are very expensive to source and this is one of the main ways, if not the main way, that they source performing dolphins. Personally, I just don't see the, um, the justice in having uh, whales and dolphins performing in these places. I, I just think that it messes with them too much. Um, I don't think it's a healthy environment. So, yeah, I don't know where that's going to go. But if, if, if it were up for me, I'd be very happy to see those out of aquariums. About 13 minutes in, they're speculating why uh, so many of the dolphins are killed as opposed to sold to aquariums. The speculation is because the dolphins are competition for food and they, they're seen as pests in the ocean. I have heard that fishermen don't like having dolphins around places where they fish. I have heard that. But uh, I didn't know that this was a form of, of pest control. That's, that's kind of upsetting. But I, I don't know how to judge whether Japan is overfishing compared to other places or not. I'm open to, to learn more about that. See, now around the 14 minute mark, Ali is hitting on an idea that, that I agree with. Uh, my, my previous uh, video was saying that, that the whale issue is uh, like a false foot uh, taking people's attention away from because whales are a very emotional issue for many people and it's taking attention away from issues that are probably more pressing which is the general fisheries here ali is talking about uh, tuna bluefin tuna in particular how there are three percent of their stocks from the 1970s i'll take his word on the statistic i haven't looked it up myself however this is very much what I've heard is that the real pressing matter is the condition of the ocean fisheries in general. And one purpose of whaling in Japan is to take attention because whaling, you know, most people are going to care more about a cute whale that makes whale sounds and stuff than a tuna, which is, you know, kind of robotic and hive like. We're still down in the same area, Taiji. He's starting to notice that there are a lot of other fish here, including sharks that are being finned shark finning, uh, which is something that, yeah, I'm really against. And, and you're going to see in this video, actually, I had no idea the, the numbers of, of sharks that are taken. I'm guessing that nobody has an exact idea because so much of this shark finning goes on illegally or unknown. He mentions here that that's happening down in this part of Japan as well. And he's, he's filming, I'll give him, this guy has guts. I would never be able to have guts like this. You know, he's getting serious harassment from uh, filming in general. I think later he, he uses some, some spy, spy cameras, which is, I'm wondering why he didn't do that from the beginning. 
So here at the 17 minute mark, he identifies in his mind that shark finning is a huge problem. So he decides to take it to Hong Kong to go directly. I guess that's the big trading capital because most of the global catch of shark finning goes to China. And I guess it passes through Hong Kong. So that's where he takes it next. So here, as Ali is exploring Hong Kong, and here he's using spy camera. It's really fascinating. He, he's interviewing this fellow, which is Paul DeGelder, who was a Navy diver who was attacked in 2009 in Sydney Harbor by bull sharks. Although I heard it might have been a juvenile uh, great white. But anyway, he, he lost his right part of his right arm and his right leg. And he's an advocate of sharks now. And... I, Ironically, I just saw this guy on Japanese TV taking uh, Mike Tyson underwater for a shark dive to do some kind of a, a tonic where you hypnotize the shark, that sort of thing. Tell you what, one of the things, I don't know about you, Jaws as a kid scared the hell out of me. It, scared, it made me so scared of sharks and it even made me scared to be in a damn pool at night alone. I'd look down in that darkness of the deep end and imagine a shark coming up. You know, I was afraid in the ocean. I think Jaws, as great a movie and a classic it is, you know, I love the movie, uh, I think it really did an injustice for sharks in maligning them for decades, which probably made it easier to be uh, depopulating them in this way. I just wish that, that sharks hadn't been uh, maligned as much uh, from, that, from that movie. That's one regret I have of a great movie. I'm at the 19 minute mark about uh, how down the shark populations are. Thresher down 80%, bulls down 86%, uh, smooth hammerheads 86%, scalloped 99% scalloped hammerheads down from 1970. That is staggering. Now scalloped hammerheads are actually ones that I've seen here in Japan. So they're, they're kind of famous. And here in Japan, they go from the lower uh, equatorial waters down way below uh, uh, Okinawa in the winter. That's where they're hanging. And then as the water warms up, they come up the coast of Japan and go into the Arctic waters for feeding and they make that annual migration. In the Atlantic, uh, I think scalloped do a different but similar kind of migration as well. But holy cow, 99% down. If that's true, that is absolutely shocking, isn't it? Okay, here I am at 21 minutes and they start to make one of the points that's going to be important later in the video. Uh, and I'm sure is very true. They're talking about bycatch. Now, uh, he mentions that something like, I don't know, between 10 and 30,000 sharks are killed an hour. And he says most of those are bycatch. So in nets or on long lines, so they're, they're never going to be eaten. They're just tossed over the side. And that is a real crying shame. And what you're going to see as this uh, documentary progressive, um, the issue of bycatch, which I knew was, was an issue. But if the data in this uh, documentary is correct, it's it's way more of, a, of an issue than, than I had even anticipated. Yeah, so now here I am around the 23 minute mark and he's, uh, what's the guy? Ali is talking about uh, there are laws on the books that are supposed to regulate uh, bycatch and how governments find it really undoable. And this is going to be one of my main takeaways from this kind of a video and something that I've, that I've always felt myself the difference between a domesticated food source and a wild food source right domesticated food sources look morally you think what you want right whether you know it's better to live as a cow in a field or a pen or better to live as a wild tuna I'm not going to talk about the quality of life. I'm just going to talk about the manageability of that food source. When you know how many cows you have, you can count them. You know how to manage them. You know which are good, which are bad. I know how many I eat. I know many how many I don't eat. With a wild tuna population, I, I don't. I don't necessarily know exactly how many I have. I don't know how many people are eating them legally or illegally or. Uh, killing them by accident or on purpose. When I have my cows that I can look at every day, I know that information. So this part of the movie starts to talk about that sort of a thing. And now they're starting to talk about the Sea Shepherd. Now here they, they mention, and it's some of the Sea Shepherd people bringing this to light, that actually, uh, for example, the number of, of dolphins that are killed in, uh, in Taiji is, is quite small actually compared to the bycatch of just even one major country. Uh, I, and I suspected that and that's a shame. Yeah, this part of the, the documentary starts to get more 
conspiratorial, and it is upsetting if true. It's talking about how the agencies that are supposed to be like stamping tuna as as safe, like dolphin safe, or sustainably fished, or or that sort of thing. Um, in, in reality, some of those organizations are untruthful, if not uh, deceptive. So observers that aren't going out or are obstructed and uh, just a, a lack of oversight by this uh, stamp of approval. So that, that's, if true, that, that's kind of an upsetting thing. All right, I'm at the 28 minute mark and one of the big takeaways here is the dolphin safe stamp, the dolphin safe label apparently doesn't mean maybe anything. That's, that's kind of upsetting, isn't it? All right, so just at the 28 minute mark, uh, the video starts to talk about uh, fishing nets and how the I, I didn't know this I, I've you know as a diver I've seen fishing nets discarded fishing nets underwater um, some quite big ones actually but I did not know that this was a major source of ocean pollution I had no idea I didn't know why would why would they discard these things it's interesting so I guess fishing nets discard ropes and, and nets and they, they go on killing of course and apparently, now they're going to see different statistics here, but apparently it can be almost half of the plastic uh, or debris in the ocean. And what the claim is here, this is part of the conspiracy, that that, is, that information is suppressed even by the organizations that say they're protecting the oceans from plastics. Perhaps the fishing industries are too strong uh, for these organizations to go against. And so I would argue that these pushes, yeah, make sure Starbucks doesn't have straws. You know, it gives people something to put their energy to rather than, and I think arguably your, your mileage may vary. I'm going to guess straws are a pretty small part of, of this, especially from developed nations. Whereas, as they're saying, uh, a much bigger danger are these nets that make up half of the debris, but do more of the killing because they're still a net. And I think, you know, just having people take up causes that, that probably have a very minor impact, but a, a big psychological impact for the people who are involved, uh, you know, get them motivated for something that doesn't really get at the heart of the matter and doesn't fight against big business is a better course of action in the minds of these organizations. Let's continue. Yeah, continuing with this theme, they talk about how many sea turtles are killed as bycatch or in a stray fishing line or stray fishing nets and it's staggering however they mentioned that oh but you did get to see on the news that one straw being taken out of the nose of that one turtle which i'm guessing is astronomically rare uh, however very interesting they're saying that you don't see on the news the, the catastrophic killer and again i think this is part of the bait and switch uh, part of taking our attention away from the bigger problem with the smaller problem, that, that, but one that, that goes for the heartstrings. Yeah, so here at the 33 minute mark, he's talking to the, uh, the CEO, so Diana uh, Cohen, the CEO of this coalition. And this is where the video starts to make the case for eating less fish. Um, is the only way to get around all this bycatch and the, the fishing net pollution. And I won't make any judgments about that. I'm just going to communicate that's what he's saying. I'm not a big seafood eater as it is. I'm a, I'm a steak man. But uh, so this is where the, I think the documentary starts to make its, its primary thesis at the 33, 34, 35 minute mark. Uh, Ali starts to make a connection between this plastic pollution coalition and the Earth Island Institute. And apparently they're both and all involved with this dolphin safe label overseeing organization. And so he's starting to make a case that this whole thing is kind of a syndicate that's covering its own tracks. It's putting out um, false action, uh, action that doesn't, you know, let's get these straws out of here. Let's leave the fishing industry alone, the bigger killer, because, you know, we don't want to see that. This is where I think he starts to make the biggest case for this sea spiracy. Okay, here at the 38 minute mark, they've already just started to covering some grounds about what is the sustainability of the ocean. This again comes to my issue about the difference between a domesticated food supply and a wild food supply. And this issue opens up the vulnerability of a wild food supply. You know, who's managing it? Are all the countries managing it equally? And if some countries are, some aren't. Unfortunately, these food supplies, they travel 
between these countries, countries that are controlling well and countries that aren't controlling well. Also, in this wild ecosystem, you have animals that are depending each other, right? They have a circle of life. Whereas my cows, you know, if I, if I one day decide, all right, well, I'm going to sell all those cows, right? There was no food system in that corral or something like that. But in any case, they're making a case for a possibly as, you know, 2048, a fishless ocean. I don't know about that. Yeah, I think I think they're definitely making a, a good case for the de fishization of the ocean. And definitely yeah, here at the 42 minute mark, this is very interesting and I believe it. So talking about uh, so um, bottom trawling with certain kinds of fishing, like shrimp fishing, and I, I don't know, other sorts of fishing as well, uh, just destroys the uh, plant life under underneath the water. And they're talking about how important the plant life is and the oxygen production. Wow, 27 football fields of rainforest every minute, the equivalent of being uh, cleared uh, through fishing activities. Yeah, it's pretty devastating. All right, so here at 45 minutes is something that, that interests me a great deal, uh, talking about the domesticated food supply versus wild. They're talking about what is a sustainable fishery. And I, I, I wonder who's capable, who's qualified to make that determination. I'm sure, you know, it's just like global warming. Who, who's going to agree on that? But what they're saying is here, the people that he's interviewing uh, our people are saying like nothing <laughs> at the moment, nothing. We just need to stop fishing, stop eating fish. It seems clear we should at least uh, probably eat less fish, I would agree, uh, or less fishing or make fishing more sustainable, like get a handle on it, on this uh, net pollution and the bycatch. Uh, I don't have answers for that. Okay, I'm here at the 51 minute mark and they're continuing with the theme that sustainability is just a myth at the moment and including the ways to certify sustainability. And they're talking about some organizations that put the blue check mark of sustainability on seafoods and how it's just, a, at the moment, it's a farce um, and part of the conspiracy. What I can say about that topic here in Asia, there are one or two countries, mostly one country, that's pretty famous about stealing the fish of other countries. And this is the reason why, one of the reasons why uh, countries, especially island countries like in, in Southeast Asia uh, argue about borders is because borders contain ocean and ocean contains fish or oil or minerals. So you're not talking about the land more often, you're talking about the ocean, fishing rights. A lot of this post-World War II arguing here in Southeast Asia has to do with the water boundaries. Who owns the fish? Who owns the minerals? Who owns the, the sea lanes? So that is a huge issue here in Southeast Asia. All right, here at the 102 mark, the video starts to talk about an interesting topic that I've, I've looked into a bit, fish farming, aquaculture. On the surface, it seems like a very attractive option, right? They might be going a little too dark with it, but there definitely are concerns. For example, uh, you have a large number of animals in a small area, so you're gonna have to treat them for antibiotics, you know, for, for drugs, for infestations. That's something that could pollute the water around it. Um, they, they have higher diseases and parasites, you know, which could affect the washings adder. I, I don't know how that works out as a wash, uh, but also you have to feed those fish something. And then there's a whole issue. How are you catching these things? Is there a bycatch? How is that affecting the environment? Yeah, around an hour and 14, he goes to the Faroe Islands to see a sustainable whale hunt. I think it was pilot whales. And uh, it's a pretty brutal scene if, uh, you know, if you're a whale lover and you don't like gore this is this is a tough one yeah i mean killing whales is brutal now this fellow they interview is around the 118 mark i think this is one of the most interesting parts philosophically of the whole video so what the the whaler says he's talking about the value of life is there more value to taking the life of a whale versus a cow versus a chicken versus two salmon and he's thinking no he's thinking uh, if i understood correctly a life as a life i think this you know, this has some, this is worth something to think about. Some sea animals like, you know, whales and dolphins are, are uh, cuter than, than cows and sheep to many people. But, you know, is one of those lives worth more than another is what this part of the documentary is making us think about. And I think that is something worthy to think about. And what the guy says is, you know, if you're a vegetarian, you're good. I, I understand your philosophy. He said, but if you eat any meat... You know, can you really be making a judgment about which life is more dear 
or more cute or more sentient. And I think this is a part of, of the video that could make people uh, really think. So from this point on in the video, uh, he interviews people about the, the sentience or the potential sentience or the uh, ability to feel of fish. And so he, because he's starting to think more about valuing the life of a fish, because probably before this point in his research, he was thinking, well, mammals, they're higher life forms. They think, they're sentient, they feel, they're more like me. Whereas lower forms of life, the fish and sp smaller fish, especially, you know, they're, they're more just food. So here at the 122 mark, um, Ali starts to make and investigate the case of what, what would we be giving up if we stopped eating fish? The high levels of heavy metals and PCBs and other uh, elements that are collected, uh, bioaccumulated in, in fish. Um, I think it, it's supporting his, his print, which becomes we have to stop eating fish or drastically reduce it and stop this unsustainable fishing practice. All right, so that was the end of the, of the video. So to, to summarize, it, it makes a big close talking about basically stop eating fish. And I think so the points they covered, so plastics, that plastic is partially a misdirection. So it's a smaller part of a larger problem, which is overfishing and the pollution that comes from overfishing, the nets and the bycatch from fishing. Um, so, you know, this worrying about plastic straws at Starbucks is, is a misdirection. Um, also, he's talking about Dolphin Safe, how Dolphin Safe appears to be just BS and is working with these anti-plastic agencies um, to kind of turn a blind eye to the larger unsustainable practices. Um, and then there's the idea of sustainability. So I can't make a judge about sustainability and where we're at, but it's something I'm curious about and I'm definitely going to check into. I'd like to take my hat off to Ali. Uh, you could see from this, he's just a regular guy who was motivated to take action and he did something. So I, I salute him in that for sure. In terms of not eating fish or s people stop eating fish, yeah, it's probably a good idea. Like I said, personally, I'm not a big fish eater. I've never, I've never been. Yeah, it's easier for me to say. I know here in Japan and in Asia, that's going to be a tough thing to sell. Um, on a larger scale, I think, uh, you know, I, I encourage you to have a look at my, my short video about, about whaling in Japan, uh, as I think it is a misdirection uh, for this sort of a reason. And uh, also, I think um, this brings to light my own personal observation of a domesticated food source versus a wild food source, that a wild food source, especially one that's hidden in the ocean, is much harder to manage and you have to depend on the hearts of men and women to uh, abide by rules and laws um, and, and keeping that sustainable. So I think it's just fraught with, with difficulty. And last, philosophically, spiritually, religiously, from the first little one-celled creature that, that decided millions or billions of years ago, whatever you believe, to start eating other organisms instead of making its own food from chemicals or from the sun, we were kind of cursed with a certain kind of cursed because once once you have to consume other creatures to, to live, you're, you're, you are kind of have an original sin or, or, or you know, you, you have a darkness about you as a creature that, uh, you know, it's a sadness that you're going to have to consume other things, other living things to, to exist. So there is that philosophical question as well. Anyway, uh, those were my thoughts on this video. I think it was interesting. It's certainly well done. I'm sure it's going to be uh, successful. Gives us a lot to think about. I look forward to reading your comments below. I hope I gave uh, some insights as an ocean person and a diver. And thank you for joining and see you on down the road. Thank you.